this can be a little bit tricky. When you've got polyatomic ions, going from the formula to the name can give us a little bit of trouble. So for instance, if we had something like um, K2SO3, right, we would have to go ahead and we take that and pick it apart. We'd have to look at the K and recognize that the K2 means that there's two potassiums, and we know the charge on potassium is one plus because it's in group one, and the SO3 we'd have to recognize as a polyatomic ion with a charge of two minus. Now we can also see the golden rule, right? So these two minuses cancel out the two one pluses, so we are golden, and the name of it, K, is potassium. Does it have a variable charge? If it did, we'd need to include it, but it doesn't, so we don't need to say potassium 1 or anything like that. SO3 2 minus is sulfite, so this would be called potassium sulfite. Okay, now here's a tough one. So if we had something like Fe ooh, SO4, okay. So at first sight, this actually looks fairly easy, but it actually contains a little riddle on the inside because Fe can have a variable charge because it's a, one of those transition metal ions. SO4, however, always has a charge of two minus. So since the charges have to cancel, what must the ions charge be? That's right, it's gotta be two positive. And so when we name this, okay, so it is iron two sulfate. Or, because iron is the iron 2 is the lower charge, we could also name it ferrous sulfate. And I think this section of the course is probably where it takes lots and lots of practice. If you go to my website and you pull up all my old exams, you can find loads of these. I normally have like 10 to 20 problems on every exam that I say, okay, turn it into a name, turn it into a formula. And at the end of the chapter, there's loads of them. The ebook has them too. It has little work type videos if you want to watch more videos. Uh, they are super fun to do once you get into them. But uh, it's certainly one of those things where you can watch videos and you're like, yeah, it's so easy, right? And I totally got it. And then you do it for the first time on the exam and you blank out because it's actually a little bit challenging and you really have to practice with these. I'll put some on the homework this week, but uh, make sure you take the time to practice this stuff. Do you want another to practice? Oh, uh, sure, why not, right? You can always just skip forward a couple of minutes if you don't want to do another one, but uh, here's another one. Um, so CU, um, F. Oh, that's not a polyatomic ion, is it? Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, CUNO2. Uh, is that a good one? Let's go ahead and make it something like that. I think that's a little better. So try and name that one. Pause the video, name it, and then I'll go through it here in a second. Okay, let's try this one, shall we? So CU, there's one of them. Um, NO2, the parentheses and the two, tells us there's two of them. We have to know our charges. So uh, nitrite, NO2, has a charge of minus one. Since there's two of them, we must have equal and opposite charge on the copper. So that would mean it was copper with a two positive charge. And when we name it then, the charge is part of the name for this uh, stock name here. So copper two, nitrite. And although there's two nitrites, right, we don't name it any differently, right? So whether it's one, two, three, or four, it's always called nitrite. In the next chapter, we'll see for molecules, we have to name the number we have. We have to say if it's two of these and one of these, because in molecules, the atoms can combine in lots of different ways. For ionic compounds, the golden rule says the charges have to cancel. There's only one way the charges ever cancel, so there's only ever one formula that we can write from a given name, or vice versa, one name from a given formula. One last little mention here, acids versus bases. Now we'll spend a whole chapter talking about acids and bases, but this is a good time to mention it because acids are things that contain the H plus ion, and bases are things that form the OH minus ion in solution. And let me just give you an example of an acid. So an acid might be something like um, HCl, and when HCl dissolves in water, it actually releases the H plus ion and the Cl minus ion. And so oftentimes we see an ionic compound with an H in it in the form of H plus. So we can recognize it as an acid. Uh, another example of an acid is something like H 
NO3, which is nitric acid, when it dissolves in water, it forms the H plus ion, and, uh, oops, the NO3 minus ion, do you remember the name of NO3 minus? Yep, it's nitrate. So uh, why do we know it's an acid? Well, it's got that H plus ion right there. So we find that acids, things that taste sour, um, things that lower the pH, right, they often contain that H plus ion. Now, the OH minus ion is something that bases have. So if you've got something like uh, milk of magnesia, uh, milk of magnesia contains magnesium hydroxide. And when you dissolve it in water, it breaks down and forms magnesium and hydroxide. Okay, we're going to write it like this. OH minus, it forms two of them. We'll write the two in front of them. They don't stick together, so we write a coefficient in front. Okay, we're going to talk about this when we talk about balancing equations, so don't worry too much. And magnesium's charge is too positive. But the key thing here is that whenever you see hydroxide inside of something, when it dissolves in water, it often releases it and makes a basic solution. So uh, OH minus is an ion that if things contain it, or can form it in water, it is consistent with it being a base. And if it has the H plus ion, it's consistent with it being an acid. So that's the very last thing in the chapter. Well done, you've made it through another week of these lectures. So um, look out for the homework. And uh, our first exam should be coming up fairly soon. So uh, that sounds like fun. Bye-bye.